Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Film Collaborative's panel, Impact Global Video on Demand, Films Free for Good, otherwise known as Impact Global VOD, Films Free for Good. So thank you so much to our panelists, uh, E. Chen and Wendy Bernfeld and Tracy Holder for joining us today. Um, we're, we're excited to talk to all of you and hear your thoughts about how to distribute important, impactful films. We're really focusing on documentaries, but it could be uh, also thinking about fiction narrative films that have a that are cause oriented, where the goal is to distribute the films around the world with a, with a focus on impact and the films being seen and not necessarily revenue. Um, and the reason this idea came about, I just want to explain Film Collaborative has an initiative that's, that's looking into this because at the end of the day, we know, I mean, the data just is obvious, is clear that the big corporate uh, American owned global streaming platforms are only buying so many of these films, a small fraction, right? And, and filmmakers made their films to be seen and uh, to, to have an impact. And most of the time, those films are not gonna get those deals. And sometimes they might even get those deals but there's a better, a better option, especially if their goal is impact. Um, and that's what we wanna talk about today. Uh, there's an example film that I'm thinking of called Act Like a Holy Man, where the entire film has been funded philanthropically. There's no focus on commerce, on revenue generation. And the focus is very much around getting it, in, getting it to audiences of all types around the world so that they can experience it uh, the, the film directly. And that usually means that, the, that they don't have to pay for it extra, right? So it's, it's getting it into all the usual places where people see films, but especially in their homes, which is most of the time where folks are, are, are watching content. Um, and I want to just explain a little bit more before we dive into questions. This is not to replace all the standard grassroots impact work, non-theatrical distribution, which includes educational distribution, uh, and, and event screenings and hybrid theatrical or maybe even theatrical. This is not to replace any of that. Rather, it's, it's thinking through coordinating with all of the typical distribution that's particularly important for documentaries, educational distribution being critical for documentaries and other cause-oriented cinema. But then to say, what happens after that? Do filmmakers have options? And we think they do. And we're gonna talk about those today to raise more support in effort you know, to support the distribution of the films on platforms around the world that are not just, you know, the big commercial global streamers that are US based. Um, and, the, and then to, you know, do impact work around that. Um, and what does that look like? So, you know, and I, I, before I turn to you, Tracy, to ask you about the, the fundraising part, because that's, you know, obviously, filmmakers stumble upon, they barely scrape the money together to make the movie. It's always hard to raise money for distribution. Um, I should note that Roco has a new initiative. Roco, the, the doc sales company and educational distributor that's a co-owner of Film Platform, they have a, an initiative that is interesting that's also looking to engage traditional distributors around the world to do this kind of work. I'm not sure I'm not trying to sell their services, but you know, it's the, the point is we're trying to aggregate all the information available uh, to express how this can be done, uh, that filmmakers can try to do it themselves. And obviously we're happy to talk to filmmakers about, about you know, advising them and so on. So Tracy, um, starting with you, because the money's got to come first uh, before folks can turn to doing the work. Um, I'd love to know, you know, just so you can explain your background, because you're such a fundraising guru, a little bit about your background first, and then I'll dive into some questions. Okay. Um, thanks, Orly. I'm happy to be here today with everyone. Um, so by way of introduction, um, I am a filmmaker. Um, my background, I come from politics, and uh, film for me is a, a form of activism through storytelling. And uh, for some reason, um, I've had a lot of success with grants and all of my work, um, I now also produce films, has been funded through grants. I work, I support myself, as you mentioned, it's, you know, earning a living as a filmmaker is almost impossible. 
And so I supplement my income um, by doing webinars and working with media organizations and with filmmakers, helping them on funding strategy and on um, impact campaigns and on grant writing. And so I've raised um, over $3 million for my own projects. I'm working on a new film now. And so writing grants all the time. And the impact I think has really, um, in terms of expanding our audiences and really allowing our films to um, have impact in a way that at a moment where um, media is so um, bifurcated, it's so, um, you know, there are so many outlets. I think documentary has really gained a prominence um, as a place that people are really looking for information or ways to connect to our society. And so impact is a way to amplify our ability to reach audiences and for our films really to make a difference around the issues that we've spent so much time trying to, um, to envision in a creative way through story, through character, to make accessible often a lot of abstract issues to make them uh, uh, accessible to the public. So funding is, as you pointed out, a critical part in that reach. And so one of the things that I think is most important is when that you have to start thinking about your distribution from the beginning of your project, right? It can't be an add-in late in the game. And if you think about when you're, you know, since I spend my life writing grant applications, um, I'm always thinking about if I'm in a, you know, if I've submitted an application, the deadline for the Sundance Documentary Film Fund, for example, was two days ago. Um, and uh, I know many of us were working on that application, myself included. Um, I'm always thinking if I can get myself to be a finalist in that round, right? They've started with, let's say 600 applicants and they're now down to the final 30 and they can only fund 10 to 15. What is going, and they're deciding between now, right? They've, they've honed that round, they've gone through it multiple times and now you're dealing with the best of the best. These are the 30 survivors, right? These are the 30 amazing films that if we lived in a just world where public funding of the arts was a part of our belief system, <laughs> all, of funds, all of these projects would be funded, right? They're that competitive, they've made it this far, but now the funder only has money for half of them. And you're, so it's down to two projects. If you're in that situation and you have already started thinking about an impact campaign, right? And you've, either already reached out to organizations who you think your project aligns with their mission and can amplify their work and serve their ends, not only your own, and you can articulate a vision or you actually have reached out to some groups and gotten preliminary interest and you can describe that vision as you're applying for your project, seems to me if it's between two equally good projects, that's going to tip the scale. The other advantage of doing that and trying to think early on about the distribution and about the impact is that you're already starting to build the audience for your film, right? You are building relationships that have long-term significance. And so um, I'm working on a new film right now and I have a relationship from my last film. And so I've already, I've not shot a frame of footage, but I've already got a partnership with um, the public theater, a major theater here in New York. They were uh, the subject of my previous film. And um, I have reached out, my film deals with uh, this crazy riot in 1849, uh, over uh, two rival productions of Macbeth. Um, and I reached out, 22 people died, 15,000 people took to the streets of New York. I mean, it's a crazy story, but I've already reached out to what's called the Folger Shakespeare Library, the largest collection of Shakespeare's works in the world, bigger than anything in the UK. 
and they've agreed to do a small companion traveling museum exhibition, right? So now I have, when I apply, not only do I have a film, I have these partnerships attached, right? Between me and somebody else who has an equally compelling great project, I'm hoping that will tip the scale. So I'm always trying to think about who are my potential allies in the world and how can I start involving them at the outset? And that will evolve over time, but I think it's really important to go into this, into our projects, thinking of them holistically from start to, to, to release. A thousand percent, and I have to know, and I have more questions for you, but that a lot of what you said is stuff, Film Collaborative, John Reese, a lot of folks in the business talk to filmmakers about, because I think, you know, there's that incorrect assumption that they will simply, you know, get into the A-list festivals and then land that big deal. And since most of the time that doesn't happen, it really behooves them to do just what you said for all sorts of reasons, uh, um, you know, in addition to everything you said. So, but, but in terms of figuring out, uh, I mean, you know, which kinds of films will get what kind of philanthropic support and how to go about it. Uh, you know, what should they definitely do, which they definitely avoid any kind of for folks to have an understanding of how to pursue this because it's, it's time, it's time consuming grant writing and even knowing how to do it, where to do it, all that. Right. I mean, I think you raise a really good point. And I think the first thing you have to ask yourself is whether this is the most strategic use of your time and efforts, because <laughs> It is so labor intensive and it is so time consuming, though it also, you know, hopefully this work that you're creating is part of a larger body of work, right? And therefore these investments of time will serve you long-term. So that's one consideration. But what I always do is I feel like I don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. So I'll give you an example. Um, I worked, I produced a film, uh, two years ago, a film called Grit that was on POV um, in the fall, and it had premiered at um, Hot Ducks two years ago. And it's a film that deals with um, this catastrophic environmental disaster in Indonesia. A multinational was drilling for natural gas. It went terribly wrong. It, um, and the, they struck an underground volcano of toxic mud. And overnight, 17 villages were consumed by this tsunami of mud. And the film is about the villagers fighting for compensation from the multinational. So what's gonna be our impact campaign? So I realized that uh, Josh Fox had done this very successful film called Gasland. It was a film about fracking in the United States. It was very successful. So I immediately looked up who are the festivals that showed Gasland, right? So I already had idea of what festivals were interested in the subject, but then I also looked at who were the partners that he was working with, who were the funders who supported his campaign. So I'm always trying to think creatively from the outset, what other projects are similar to mine? And like I, you know, Sundance was on last week and I watched a number of wonderful films. And, uh, and I then, I'm one of those crazy people who at the end of a, like Sundance had at the beginning, they have a trailer and it lists all of Sundance's funders. I took screenshots of every single one of those. I have a list. So I often think of films that are similar in subject. Often I don't even watch them. That's not true, but sometimes I don't. I go straight to the credits or I go to their website and I look at their funders. That's my first source of inspiration. And I do the same around the impact campaigns. I always look at who are the organizations that have already got experience working with media that know the value of narrative to put a human face on a lot of wonkish abstract policy issues and make them accessible to a wide audience. So that's one of the ways I go about that process early on. I have one last question for you and I have, but I have to note, I was a programming associate at Sundance when Josh Fox submitted Gasland at a, at a significantly long rough cut, but it was unmistakably 
uh, special at the time. And we're very thrilled about, and we work with him still. Um, uh, my last question for you is in terms of like specifically raising money to do global, or, you know, meaning to do video on demand distribution around the world, not a single platform deal, but do you think that's something that, because does it sound too commercial or is it something you think you can get funding for and it's just important to express the impact goals? Right. So, you know, there had been funders who were dedicated to the impact component like fledgling fund. Unfortunately, they have stopped funding that. And what I'm finding is that there are fewer opportunities expressly for impact funding, but almost, not almost every, but a lot of funders, Sundance included, if they fund the production, you are then eligible to apply for um, impact funding because they wanna see your project have reach and often they're funders that are interested in social issue projects. I think the same is true for the Ford Foundation, their Just Films program. They're very interested in social issue films. So it's, I think it's part of like, I think strategically part of your ask when you're looking for production funding or, you know, I just submitted a, an application to Sundance for development funding, but I had you know, the genesis of uh, a fully formed uh, impact campaign that I haven't, you know, other than those two partnerships, I've not reached out to anybody, but I gave them an idea of what is possible. Um, but I do think that once it's hard if you haven't gotten funding from these entities to go out. What I do think is that there are organizations who see the value of your work helping them build their constituencies. And so when I approach potential organizational partners on the ground who know their constituency, who work in the grassroots, who have, they're the gatekeepers in their fields. When I approach them, right? Cause I'm, I'm asking them to help me, but what I'm framing is saying, here is a tool that's going to help you build your audience, help you uh, talk to a larger public about your issue and to galvanize the public if it's an actionable film, right? It's saying, stop, like bag it, stop using uh, one-time use plastic bags or something that has a campaign. If you go to them and you say, you know, here's this piece that's gonna reach millions and bring an audience and bring new, uh, energy to your own movement and galvanize people, that's very compelling, which is different than saying, hey, I'm a filmmaker. I have this need. Can you help me? You're saying, hey, I'm making this thing that's going to serve your interest and showing them how this is something that's going to build, you know, that works, furthers their own work. And I think that's, and then you can also talk to them and look at who their funders are right? Because it's saying this is a tool that's really going to serve your work as much as it serves my, me building audience. Thank you so much. In your honor of your film in New York, I'm going to drink from my uh, MTA. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was fabulous. So Wendy, before we dive into the uh, extraordinary depths of your expertise, can you just explain a little bit about your background <laughs> so, so we understand how you come by your, your knowledge? Uh, yes, so I guess I might be the black sheep on the panel because the uh, I'm originally a lawyer and then a uh, pay TV movie exec, uh, Canal Plus, you know, this sort of world internationally. I'm originally Canadian living in Europe. So because I'm old, my roots are in traditional uh, production, distribution, pay TV, et cetera, regular channels, and uh, more on the other side of the ocean, so uh, not North America. But what's... Uh, interesting is after 15 years doing that, um, since 99, I formed Right Stuff and 70% of the time we're actually working for VOD platforms before they launch or after they launch when they move into new regions or business models or genres. You know, if you even think about a Netflix, there was a period at the beginning where you couldn't give a documentary away and now it's a massively important part of the category. This phenomena happens with 
all of these VOD platforms on the other side. You just may not know of all of them or you know which countries they're in or what they do. So 70% of the time I'm looking at it from a buyer or funder of originals point of view. And as a, um, an agent who doesn't take the IP, I'm a consultant uh, filmmakers deal in their own name or the rights holders sign in their own name. And the other 30% of the time I'm working with uh, rights holders or filmmakers, creators who want to go beyond just the big five, the big guns, or now the big 12, <laughs> uh, to who else is out there that's either buying or funding. Now, in a funny parallel way to what Tracy was saying, we're, we've only met today, but there's a similar method you kind of have to look at who else is out there and what's on their service that already fits. So either they're doing something right in the sweet spot and then you can pitch that, or um, they don't have it, in which case your spin should be different. Like why aren't you doing a climate or need to film or a social doc film? And you know, bring this to this missing gap on your platform. So I guess it's safe to say 70% um, of the, well, I guess the platforms that I'm dealing with are going beyond just the big five. They're what you might call the boring ones, telecom or cable or regular TV that have added a VOD of their own in their own kind of a me too panic jockeying for position. And they're the mainstream competitors in every region, sometimes multi-region, 10 or 20 countries. And they're buying and also funding, you know, so they're quite significant, but just not as well known overseas. And then there's the one level down, if you like, is the niche passion platforms, the ones that aren't mainstream competition against Netflix and Amazon, but they're focused 100% on either art house or feature film curation, or they are doc specialists. And within the doc specialist platforms, like obviously in the US, you have your curiosity streams and your variations, but they all have a different personality. You know, there are uh, some that are educational and scientific and others that are millennial skewed, fast paced and others that are social cause skewed. So I guess it's, it's a lot of work the first year to, if you didn't choose to do a big five deal or you got the big five deal and said I don't want my film lost in a in a week even though I'll get rich if you've well, gone beyond rich. that if, by the way it's not yeah. Always rich. yeah not always rich but if you go beyond them the first year can be uh, a lot of matchmaking because each country has mainstream competitors telecom cable tv with SVOD and ADVOD and then each country, or subscription VOD, and each country has um, niches. And the, the niche services can often be global. So if you can go to the most important ones that are really dedicated to that niche or passion, uh, and you can focus on their uh, PR and desire for impact, either because corporately they want that image or because they genuinely carry that programming. Either way, <laughs> there's a, a huge universe out there and I, I can give some examples uh, yeah, later if you I mean, like. I'd like, to, I wanna drill right into what you just said. So first of all, 30,000 foot view, just so we have a, an understanding, yeah. I don't think most people do. How many, I mean, are there not, I thought you once said there was like over 3000 platforms in Europe, not to say that every one of them is yeah. so perfect. No. Yeah. Right. I mean, technically, there's 3000 VODs in Europe alone, I think a kind of irrelevant statistic, because you'd want to focus on maybe 50 to 70, who are either, yeah, high rep, high paying, multi region, uh, proper, reliable, whatever. So if we just, if we just focus even on that, right. then you would go, um, regionally to your equivalent, like your Comcast or your Cablevision, that counterpart exists in France, uh, let's say Orange, which is in uh, not only France, but um, uh, Central Europe, Africa, Spain, you know, so one deal, and they cover pay-per-view, paper, month, ad-supported, 
they carry the Netflixes of the world, but they also have niche offers that are small subscription VODs. Um, you know, if you if you look at companies of that size, like Orange in France, Telefonica in Latin America, B Sky B even, which is um, uh, British, obviously, but uh, also in Italy and Germany, um, you have huge potential impact. And then you go to the more niche platforms like a DocuBay in India, which is in 180 countries, or an I Wonder in Southeast Asia, um, many of them buy and fund. You just have to almost patchwork, work your way across and do multiple non-exclusive deals because that's the, that's the catch. The good catch is that most of the time they will deal direct. You won't need an aggregator or middleman or although it's often faster, but it's not a legal requirement. There's not a gatekeeper for a lot of them. And the deals can be non-exclusive and windowed, you know, so the subscription VOD first and then the AdVod and then, you know, the big one and the small one. So yeah, I can give you some examples, but I was quite fired up to find out that um, as I updated myself before the panel, a lot of the platforms that even the very commercial mainstream ones have started adding a niche for impact climate you know uh gender issues so okay it's not going to be the bulk of their 5,000 movies but they will now have room and it particularly was enhanced during covid uh, when more people were in lockdown they were running out of the usual uh, they started expanding and testing other sources of supply and other genres that they wouldn't have bought before. And uh, then after a 30 day trial, people stayed with the service and you know, went, went on and they realized, hey, you know, they just need exposure to these topics that are not Breaking Bad or <laughs> The Killing. And uh, you can develop a passionate following as well. I love that show, feeling that you just brought me back. Okay, so, and I, I, you gave some examples of names. You also mentioned that in a number of cases, folks can go direct and it's a patchwork. It sounds like even harder than the grant writing, right? It sounds like, and you know, Film yeah. Collaborative has its own digital distribution guide resource and, you know, we're gonna have own. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's people out there to help with the information and with the guidance, but it sounds like, okay, let me ask you this. How many do you think uh, films, I mean, in other words, uh, what elements do you think are important for filmmakers to keep in mind when they pursue this, that they really need to mm -hmm. even fit right into a certain category, they need to have yeah. a certain profile, What's, which filmmakers should pursue this and how? Yeah, well, I think first, like what Tracy was saying before, um, you are placing more effort in the first deals with these people who don't know you, just like your first deal with a PBS or a BBC it might have taken six months. But once you're in, then future films, if you care about the future pipeline, are an Annex A, you know, with, with changes. You're, you're in, so you're building, in my view, filmmakers who want to build a pipeline, both for their business side, but also an audience fan group then they have to invest it. If you're just trying to churn it out and move on to the next movie, you can uh, delegate to uh, more conventional sales agents or distributors and say, I don't wanna be bothered, it's too much work. But frankly, um, the, the easiest approach is to just start with some of the biggest ones that are competitors to Netflix and Amazon. So I'll give you some examples like Orange I mentioned, that's 3 million subs just in France alone. Uh, you've got Sky, which is uh, you know, like 25 million subs. It's some reach. I'm not saying they'll buy every one of your movies, but if one of them hits, that's a big deal. Uh, you've got Salto in France, which were the three big public, France Television, TF1, M6, who all gave up their individual VODs last year and said, okay, that's not working. We're competing against each other. Let's combine in one. And although you may think from afar that it's all French, you know, in reality, they 50% uh, of the content on Salto is French and the rest is coming from elsewhere. 
their first step is often series and features and drama, but then they have a sizable amount of documentaries as well, including foreign language. So as people dig and peel back the onion, you can see opportunities and you only need a few. You don't need 5,000 slots. You need your film to get on. Stan in Australia is very mainstream. It's the Channel 9, it's 2 million subs, but they've also been funding originals and they're buying a library of docs, often in the impact genre, like the hunting ground or things like that. So being able to sell things that are two to eight years old helps you get in the door, they know your work, it's library non-exclusive, and then you can pitch the new film. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to pitch the new film to an unknown on the other side of the world if they've already bought something you forgot about from five years ago. <laughs> and uh, those were like the bigger players, but I wanted to mention a few narrower ones because um, I know Orly, it was important to you to get some examples. Film in Spain, it's Spain, Mexico and Portugal, but they have a massive focus beyond feature film and series and Spanish stuff, they have a big focus on causes. They have a whole eco and environmental subsection. They have GLBTQ, you know, so it's, it's looking beyond the first impression of what it looks like. And filming has been around for a decade. Um, there's these other types like Insight TV, which at first glance, even now are purely reality, adrenaline, nonfiction, not what you would imagine are impact docs. They're millennial focused, but there's three impact doc uh, projects they have in development that aren't showing on the screen yet. So that's my other point in digital, they're all jockeying for position to be more competitive. So what you might see today is, as their programming shifts. Um, DocuBay in India is in 170 countries and they have various bays including humanity, human interest, refugees, eco, gender, you know, so if you can make a sale of a library title there, they're not funding originals, they're only buying. Um, and in the UK, you could look at True Story, which fairly recently launched, but is focused on that topic only in the UK, T-Bot and s -Bot. So, I mean, those are just some examples. The last one is fairly new called Water Bear, which just launched out of uh, ZDF and off the fence. It's a niche within a niche. Basically the entire core of the SBOD is save the planet, sustainability. And instead of just viewing, you take action. You can um, sign petitions, you can donate, etc. Now that's newer earlier stage and at the moment only in the English language regions, but they've also been fun English language regions around the world, uh, like South Africa, Australia, etc. Obviously they will roll further. They've also been funding originals and the current original um, Wales and African Sea Forest is a short film original, but by the makers of the team behind Octopus the octopus film that's on Netflix, which is now up for various Emmys and Oscars and things. So you, yeah, and you might not hear the name like Water Bear or, but it's really worth the look to be very selective. There may only be 10 that you wanna deal with out of the thousands, but that opens up half the world, the world outside of, of North America. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I brought up the 3000 alone in Europe just to give folks a sense of the landscape, but I remember starting VOD in the early 2000s, and there are many platforms that were uh, that existed then that don't exist now. So it's important to sort of separate, the, as they say, the wheat from the chaff, and that's what you do. And that guidance is um, is is so re is so relevant. And it sounds like you you really spoke to. I mean, if there's anything else you want to say about reaching audiences uh, in Asia and Africa, please do. But my final question is, because we I want to turn to E, uh, you know. It's important to note uh, there, you know, folks can always distribute their films on their own, right? On Vimeo, on Altavod, which is a new platform. They can True. even get Amazon Prime. I don't think filmmakers realize that, that, that can, they can do that directly. Although 
to different degrees of reach in terms of uh, territories around the world. Uh, sometimes they will need an aggregator. You know, we work with different, have dealt with different aggregators like Quiver, Giant Interactive. Uh, Robitas is a distributor aggregator of sorts. There's also platforms like IndieFlix. We're gonna have, I just wanna note to everyone that um, we're gonna have a complete list of, of, of this kind of information, including everything folks can do themselves on the filmcollaborative.org slash digital. And we have our digital distribution guide. So a lot of you know, what's said today and, and even a lot more detail will be made available to folks um, that they can just read because it's, it's obviously too sort of exhausted to list. But you know, there's all kinds of important details in terms of subtitling requirements and delivery and what you can do directly versus what you need to go through an aggregator. But Wendy, um, to the extent that folks either can't go directly to these platforms or just don't want to deal sure. with it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there services and aggregators that you can mention just that they might? Yeah, consider? sure. So the first thing to say about the aggregators is in general, my bias, so it's an opinion, is most of the time the aggregators are focused on the big five or big 12. So they're not touching that whole area that is the middle. Um, and therefore, even if you have an aggregator, they're not going to get you onto some of the names I mentioned. They're focusing on other ones. So I would still encourage doing something more, but European also, um, some European aggregators are quite competitive and uh, have different approaches to what you, the names you mentioned. There's under the Milky Way, uh, you know, in Europe, in France, um, they also have an LA office, but there's OD Media in Holland, who's a direct competitor, Syndicato in Canada, um, ELO just, uh, began in Latin America, taking American films to Latin America, including Brazil, um, and Level K or Sweet Chili in the Nordics. And often those types have the ability to go to all the same players that your American ones do. So it becomes a game, uh, sort of a research thing to check what are they charging? What is it costing me? And what service am I getting? So sometimes something looks cheaper because the price to encode is cheaper, but then they're charging you for every little report or every foreign language and others may look more expensive, but be all in. So I would just encourage that. And the other thing I would look at is if filmmakers don't want to do it themselves, there's still sales agents and distributors, some of whom are more digital savvy and open and others are very traditional. And if you can go with the digital savvy ones, or at least have ones that are open to working with other people like an Orly or a Wendy or whoever handling digital, then you have hybrid distribution, a bit of both, and you can cover all the bases. So those are certain like the 100% of zero is zero. <laughs> you know, if someone has the rights and they're not actually exploiting them or getting them out there, it's not really very helpful. Um, I have one super quick question, and then I want to turn to you. Uh, for, for the American platforms, uh, their corollaries in different countries like Tubi and Pluto and Amazon, is there ever a reason for filmmakers to focus on those essentially American corporations? I mean, you know, one of them is owned by Fox now, mm -hmm. um, but in the, on the, in the country itself. Like, are they, in other words, do they have a big enough reach that it's worth also? Yeah. Really, do you think? Well, um, my experience has been that a lot of those platforms. Uh, take more risks and have a different approach to programming than in America. So for example, Pluto in its Berlin office will have a, a different slant um, of thoughtful programming perhaps than what's on Pluto in America now. Also, the, the most important thing to know is that the platforms from America desire to move overseas so they start to acquire more content that they could um, exploit overseas and vice versa. So Tubi can't get in at the moment to America because of uh, uh, privacy issues with its ad model, but Pluto, Pluto and Roku and all, uh, sorry, um, uh, Rakuten. You can't get into where? I think you said Tubi can't get into Europe. Can't America. get into Europe, uh, oh, yeah. uh, UK and America. Europe. They'll be, yeah, GDPR, sorry about that. Um, and. But these challenges get solved. Now, what I have found is that even a mainstream platform will have uh, a niche section and they'll go deep into it. But uh, I think the ad in Europe 
are generally speaking more commercial and the espods are much more uh, art house doc, cultural uh, society. Uh, so there's quite a lot of traction there. And I also focus on the ones that pay a flat fee, license fee, not because you care about making money, although I think it's very relevant. You can always turn the money back into your nonprofit after. <laughs> but um, the, I do it because it's a measure of, to me, it's a measure of their quality. If it's uh, if they can stand behind the service with something. Yeah. 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 All right, Yi, thank you so much for your patience. Um, Yi Chen, you're a filmmaker, so maybe just a little bit of background about you and your film before we turn to what your distribution goals were and what you think about all this. Thanks, Orly. Thanks so much for having me um, on the panel. Um, so yeah, I'm a documentary filmmaker um, based in DC and San Francisco. Um, I was uh, born and grew up in Shanghai. I immigrated to the US in 2003 and I studied film at American University. Um, after getting my MFA, I worked in documentary production and journalism. Um, and last year I became a citizen and voted for the first time. Um, so as I was going through the naturalization process, I realized that um, because I had never voted before. And so I didn't really know much about how voting works in America. So my film first vote um, initially started as a, um, a personal journey to explore voting um, from the perspective of um, voters like myself who didn't uh, grow up in a democracy and exploring what it's like for them to cast their first vote and to um, become American. So of course the film um, evolved and, um, and first vote um, follows uh, four Asian American voters, um, two Republicans and two Democrats um, living in two battleground states um, in uh, North Carolina and Ohio uh, from 2016 to the 2018 midterms. Um, so the film, uh, I finished the film last April and it premiered um, in May uh, last year. Super, and so reconciling what your distribution goals were, what happened <laughs> and what you've heard today, you know, go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wish I had um, this webinar <laughs> with Wendy and Tracy <laughs> before I started uh, making the film. Um, sweet. Um, you know, I, it's my first uh, feature length film and you know it's it's really been um, a learning process for me. Um, so yeah, so in terms of distribution, um, you know I, I um, goes actually uh, orally you mentioned um, John Reese, right? So I actually consulted him um, at Doc NYC where I also met Tracy. Um, and he said, you know in terms of your goals, there you know he said there's impact, there's, um, reach and there's your career and there's revenue, right? Which one is <laughs> higher? All of the above. Well, we, 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 we that for a long time, and we just riff off of him. We just steal it. We talk about the same stuff. And I was like, why can't I have all of them? And I realized, well, it's impossible. <laughs> Not, at least for my film. So, um, for me, I knew that impact was, um, you know, the most important thing to me. Um, particularly, the film was released in. Um, a, a very important presidential um, election year. So, um, so yeah, so um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I did, um, you know, festivals, obviously, um, about 20 film festivals, um, and, uh, you know, and also uh, worked with impact producer to develop um, an impact strategy. Um, and, you uh, uh, and also, you know, partner, working with partner organizations, um, civic engagement organization nationally and um, locally uh, to um, specifically target um, eligible Asian American voters in uh, eight battleground states um, to um, support their work um, increasing um, Asian American voter registration and voter turnout in November uh, 2020. Um, so, uh, so that's that's kind of the um, actually I you know I I I thought about distribution uh, all all of these different distribution festivals um, community screenings and um, you know broadcast so so the film had a, a national broadcast on a World Channel in October um, which is carried by 171 
uh, PBS member stations and represent 70% of the US TV household. Um, mm. and, right, so, and then we had ed educational distribution with um, Good Docs. And so um, I worked with them in terms of um, to uh, host all those uh, virtual community screenings with, um, with our partner organizations. Uh, so we did about uh, 25 to 30 screenings and panels um, at different, you know, including conferences, universities, community organizations, museums, um, public library, um, middle school, high school, um, and uh, and also um, lastly VOD, which I, I, you know, I really didn't know how to navigate that. Um, uh, and so luckily through co-production with World Channel, they recommended um, PBS distribution um, does VOD now. So, um, so they launched the film on iTunes and uh, Amazon uh, PBS documentary, um, a private video channel. Um, so that's uh, just uh, this year, last month. Um, and, and one last thing in terms of distribution that we already did, we also did virtual cinema, um, like a one month run in September, from September to October last year um, at AFI Silver Theater. Um, that's where I'm, you know, I'm uh, based. And also um, I really wanted to focus on North Carolina and Ohio where the, the stories took take place. So yeah, yeah. we did virtual cinema at Nightlight Cinema, which is in Ohio and Carolina Theater, which is in um, North Carolina. So um, yeah, so these are um, kind of an overview of, um, in terms of distribution for the um, for the film, and you're part of the Film Collaborative's Community Conversations Initiative too, which will take you to a few states. Um, it's exciting. So, but you know, I I know the issue of whether it's too American of a subject matter um, comes up for a film like yours uh, in terms of the sales agents' perceptions. Film Collaborative sometimes gets this with respect to even very high profile Sundance docs on the festival side. Um, so, what I want to ask ye and Wendy to speak to is, you know, when does a filmmaker need to just to sort of accept the truth of that and that, that it's, it's going to be difficult to, you know, uh, like I think you heard that ye right from sales agents and stuff, um, correct me if I'm mistaken, but like when is that like really the truth or versus when is there an opportunity that one should push to get? Um, so ye, first of all, you, did you, is that, I mean, I didn't hear you talk about international sales, so question there. Yeah, um, so uh, yeah, thanks for um, uh, bringing that up. That's actually um, definitely kind of one of the biggest challenge in terms of um, distribution for me. So um, the film was part of the Hot Docs um, doc shop, which is a market, and it was part of um, ITFA Docs for Sale, um, you know, which was uh, is also industry market. So um, and I reached out to um, you know a lot of uh, uh, sales agents because you know I was really hoping to get um, distribution outside the U.S. So the film uh, does not, um, as of now, doesn't have distribution outside the U.S. Um, and the response I've got, um, you know, it, it kind of uh, kind of varies. But the things that I've been hearing is um, that you know some said they want film before uh, premiere. Um, it was too late for them. It already screened at festivals um, and hmm. so said that they acquired, um, you know, similar uh, titles about American politics. Um, and some said that they wanted all rights, all territories. Um, and, you know, and also um, I heard a lot of them saying that this is a, a too much of a U.S. focused story. It will be hard to sell outside the U.S. So, so these are the things I've been hearing about. And I'm really, I would love to hear from Tracy and Wendy, like, you know, is this kind of common? And like, should I have, you know, how can I get a film outside the U.S.? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to see it. <laughs> so later on, send it. But I think uh, it very much depends. It's not so much the topic, because we've seen a lot of American politics, Trump type movies picked up all over Europe here too. Sometimes it might be hyper local, or it might just be bad timing, because certainly in the VODs, uh, there's like 
trends and fashions just like in anything else. And if they have too much in a particular genre, they then move on. So timing is, is very relevant as well. Um, I do think that certainly in Europe right now, there is a reality that a lot of these subscription VODs, not just the Netflix, Amazon, but the, uh, the levels down, they have, uh, they have to spend and have airtime of uh, their local works as well as European works. Plus a lot of, a lot of them have American content from uh, studios or majors, mini majors. So there's a smaller slot left for American indies. And it is a real challenge at this minute in time in Europe where some people like, for example, Orange may legally be required to have 30%, but it has 50% European content just you know, to overperform. Two years later or two years ago, it may not be the issue, but this sort of bias, there was a bit, there was a bit of a bias against American content for the past year or two in Europe, my perception as a buyer, and I think it came from the political situation, which is now changed. So you may start to see a huge uh, positive uptake in uh, kind of American uh, films, um, but there was a resistance before. So I, I take your point, but it's not, um, it's not over because it's, it's not a genre, it's more uh, timing and everything else, yeah. That's so instructive. Um, I want to note before I ask each of you for your final comments and perhaps even cross questions for each other that um, we're going, you know, they're giving you a website link here that we'll provide right now. And it's going to have a lot of the details around DIY, VOD, and aggregating services and also impact folks who do impact work. Um, so just folks can start to piece you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together and, and not just have to like do a mad dash and take notes. And, um, and also just, there's a lot of stuff we couldn't cover today. But so in our, yeah. in our closing moments, I mean, do any of you have any sort of parting wisdom, final tips, questions for each other, anything I'd like to turn to each of you, Tracy, uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to say. Well, a, a couple of things. So one is um, I was, you had, uh, when we were talking about the panel and planning, ask for resources, and I, I haven't gotten a chance to look at, at the link you just provided, but there is um, the Impact Field Guide and Toolkit, which is a great resource. Um, and uh, I can send a link, maybe we can share that. And then for people who are looking as they're making their films, you know, one of the biggest platforms for uh, getting funding for your production, but for films that are specifically films that are uh, focused on impact campaigns, the good pitch, which you know has now become a franchise around the world, is the place that attracts people who are most interested and funders that are most interested in impact. And it's very competitive. It's a lot of work, but if you get there, it's the best visibility your project could ever hope for. Um, and that is, um, organized by the Doc Society, and they also have an impact producers lab. So I was thinking if I were looking for an impact producer, I would look at who, it, you know, who is a, a fellow in their lab if I'm looking at a project outside of the US. In the US, Firelight Media also has an impact producer fellowship. And so I'd look there um, as to you know, who are the people who are doing this? What films have they worked on? But in UK, yeah. Right. Um, also. And in response to uh, Yi's question, I may, this might be something um, contrary to what you would think, but I actually have found, I had an experience, like an epiphany experience uh, when I was a consultant to women make movies and I was, working on an impact campaign uh, for a film now many years old by a filmmaker, Lisa Jackson, called The Greatest Silence Rape in the Congo, right? Not exactly a, you know, Saturday night, you say, oh, honey, you know, what, what are we doing on Saturday <laughs> night? Uh, you know, I know, let's watch a film about rape in the Congo. Um, but the amazing thing about that film was that, you know, I think my, 
original assumption, like most of ours, is that you want to have the widest reach imaginable, right? You want to hit everyone in the world. You want films that are universal. But what I learned from working with Lisa was here was a very, very specific film. And, but it turned out at that moment that the international human rights community wanted to make rape as a uh, tool of war, a weapon of war, a top priority. And they wanted to keep it at the top of their agenda against yeah. other competing compelling priorities. It also turned out that um, sexual violence during war or sexual violence in general has led to a new type of medical um, uh, treatments and, and teaching hospitals now have departments that focus on, unfortunately, the kinds of um, health issues that women who have been sexually violated have. And so it turned out that there was a nexus of these two communities that needed a vehicle to highlight this issue. And to my utter amazement, this film that had a very deep and narrow constituency had more distribution than any film I can think of. And that to me was mind boggling. So Yi, what I would say to you is that it's possible that maybe your reach is specific to the US, but that you need to have a very targeted campaign to mm. make sure, right? I mean, think how Georgia, right? The outcome of that uh, uh, Senate race, that critical Senate race is largely now uh, attributed to the turnout of Asian Americans. Yeah. So your film now at a moment where there is civic engagement of historic proportions and with good reason, I might add, as the, uh, the second day of the impeachment trial, second impeachment of Trump started five minutes ago, um, it is so timely and relevant. And so my suggestion in that is that you'd want to partner with exactly what you've done. I mean, everything you described sounded to me so spot on. And John is, yeah. John is you know, really great at what he does. And so I think I've seen films that are actually very targeted for audiences that are hungry. Um, there, there's a film called, I think it's Forks Over Knives about veganism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have questions about the production values of that film, but boy, <laughs> a hungry audience for that film. And those filmmakers yeah. made a ton of money. And so I think it's really being strategic always and thinking, is a global reach is trying to reach everyone, my best strategy or being targeted, is that perhaps an even more Good. effective way? And I think you, what you've yeah. achieved is remarkable. And I'm, you know, I'm so happy for you. I'm proud of you. I think that's great. <laughs> yeah, really happy yeah. For an American citizen. It's amazing. And, and from a, just from the, the comment that you had made about how you didn't at this moment have a sales agent pick up the film at these festivals. My experience has generally been, again, black sheep here, that often the sales agents, depending who you meet, can be very traditional and want certain indicators before they invest in or take on a film. Whereas if you're willing, either you or other people around you to uh, try to approach some of the platforms directly, they don't require a sales agent or a distributor. They need to just see the trailer and the outline, the press, the impact arguments you have. They'll either buy it or they won't, but you, you can go direct. You just have to be selective by looking first at what type of programming they already have. You don't wanna pitch you know, a horror platform, your doc. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that, that would be an interesting cross genre horror docs. <laughs> um, that, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Do you have any last thoughts before we close this thing out? Um, yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, Tracy, Wendy, and Orly um, for this panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I know we're running out of time. Um, I, you know, I would love to follow up um, after the panel, um, you know, in terms of impact funding and um, distribution. But um, yeah, and I hope for audiences out there, if you're interested in um, 
how some of the Asian American voters um, voted in 2016 and 2018 and why. Yes, um, yes. Check out the film um, on the Amazon and Super. I Awesome. Super. We'll, we'll put all the information on screen as well. So thank you so much, Tracy Holder, Yi Chen, and Wendy Bernfeld. You've been delightful. We're so delighted to have had this panel and hope everyone finds it useful. Stay safe and stay well. Thanks, Orly. Thanks, Orly. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye for now.